A question that comes up pretty often in the Tori ecosystem is, do I need to know Rust? The question is valid, but nuanced. Let's dig into it. So there's, there's a few pieces in this question that we should break down. When you're developing a Tori application, it will always be built with Rust. Rust will exist, but the, the deeper piece is, do you need to learn Rust to make the app? Out of the box, Tori is going to bundle up your application, run it in a web view, and give it you a binary to ship off to your consumer. Apart from that, it comes with a plugin system. The plugin system brings in different features and functionality that have the Rust code done for you. That Rust code also typically comes with a JavaScript implementation. So if your application is using a plugin and that plugin has a JavaScript interface, you can use it purely from the web view. You won't need to know any, or at least very little Rust. Now, what happens if what you want to accomplish is not represented in a plugin? That's when you get into commands. And that is when you start to get into Rust a little bit. But don't be intimidated. Let's, let's look at it. The default way in Tori to communicate between your web view and Rust is through a command. Command adds a little bit of sugar onto the process to make it easier to implement. We have a couple sections in the documentation so far. Uh, there's the calling Rust from the front end and calling the front end from Rust. There is the ability to have that two-way communication. So depending on your use case, you may need to do one versus the other. Commands are primarily for calling Rust from the front end. It triggers a function from the web view and continues execution within Rust. All of that boils down to a function called invoke. Invoke is a function which you import from the Tori API library, and that will issue a command to the Rust side of things. That invoke is the generic abstraction to post a message to Rust. We sort of have two sides of this command. This command has both the invoke, which is fired off from that web view, and then the Rust code that's handling it. Something to keep in mind, in your web view, invoke is always going to be asynchronous. So you'll always need to wrap it in a promise or use uh, async await on an invoke. So keep that in mind, invoke will always be async regardless of the command on the Rust side of things. Now where things get interesting is on the Rust side of things. We have a little bit more flexibility around how Rust handles that. They can do it sync or async. It can also use futures through Tokyo. And many of the plugins, if you start to dig in the plugin code, this is what they're using. They're using the command interface. Now, we're, we're gonna take a look at an example in the Tori plugins workspace repo. Now this is the positioner plugin. The reason to use this plugin is to position your windows either through the web view or the Rust side of things. So it has APIs that are supported in both places. And this provides a good example for us. In each of these repos, they're rather consistent. So if you're looking at the workspace repo, we typically have a source which contains Rust and a guest.js which contains the JavaScript portion of it. So there's not too much JavaScript that's going on here because most of the work, as is typical with many of these plugins, most of the work is done in Rust. And that is where that question starts to come up. Do I need to learn Rust? If you're writing a plugin, you're probably gonna need to know some Rust. The compiler is very helpful though, so don't feel intimidated by it necessarily. But you can see here, as mentioned, invoke is firing off a payload to the Rust side of things. And you can see in each of these, these are all async functions. So there's not actually that much going on in the JavaScript side of things. If you're working on a plugin or you're working on commands, you might end up writing functions that look similar to this. Writing an invoke call to match up with each of the functions on the Rust side of things may not be entirely tedious, until your plugin starts to expand. Now you need to keep both the Rust and the JavaScript parts in sync. And there's a few libraries out there that can actually help with that and make that process easier and have your functions and types generated for you for your web view. There's a library called Tori Specta. Now Tori Specta is maintained by a few folks that are also within the working group in Tori. It's not an official plugin, but there seems to be interest in potentially making that happen, but we need to take the time to do it. If that's something that you're interested in helping with, I'm sure hopping in the Discord or opening up an issue would be a great place to start. We're gonna look at an example that I did live on stream. If you're interested in experimentation and learning, feel free to hit the follow button. We do live streams every week. This is one of the examples that we went through on stream. Within this example, we hooked up Tori Spectup. 
Tori Specta exports a struct called builder. The builder struct collects the commands much like the default Tori invoke handler does. And by feeding it those commands and adding the macro on each of our commands, it knows to generate the types. We give it a place to export those types and functions. And then we pass that builder off to the invoke handler to finish wiring up those commands to Tori. Now this ends up generating a bindings file. That bindings file, you can see, will handle those invoke functions for you and include types along with it. So as you're updating your Rust code and you're taking in arguments and then returning specific data, your invoke both in and out, the payload in and the return output from that invoke will be fully type safe. It's a lovely experience to work with. So if you're doing anything more than a couple invoke commands, I would highly recommend checking it out. And I always appreciate the work that Oscar and Brendan have done on this. Okay, so now that we know how to handle and kick off code, a function from the web view, now we wanna see how we handled it on the Rust side of things. And again, this is where knowing some Rust can be beneficial. Rust is highly dependent on its type system. So I've found that using the compiler, reading the error messages and relying on the compiler to help you along rather than trying to fight the compiler, by the time everything actually compiles, the code usually seems to run. With this example in the Tori repo, we have an example for each of the different types of commands. So if you if you need a little bit of a guide or a little bit of a push on how to write these commands in each type of interface, check out this example. It's really nice. We have the kind of the default command. This is the synchronous. You're not doing anything entirely special. In this case, we're literally just printing. We're not doing anything fancy at all. And you'll, you'll note that we have a couple different args as well. We can take in the arguments from the payload and we can also just get context that's uh, available so we can get different handles. Uh, we have a couple different features here such as snake case. The defaults in JavaScript typically don't line up with the defaults for naming in Rust. Rust typically uses snake case so you, you might see some helpers improve that experience with the disambiguation. Uh, now when we get a little bit further into the command example you'll start seeing mention of future. You can think of future somewhat in the vein of a promise in JavaScript. A future is a way to handle asynchronous code. We have a few ways that we can set it up. If you, within the command, mark it as async in that macro, the return of that function will end up needing to be a future. So this is, in some ways, you would describe your JavaScript function as returning a promise. It's not, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's very close. So you can see in all of these, we're returning futures. So that's effectively like returning a promise. You can think of it like that. As we get further into the examples, there's another section on async commands. Within Rust, there's also an async function that is just shifting how you're handling your asynchronicity. So you can think of it like, the difference between async await and a promise in JavaScript. They're both asynchronous and they're sort of both handling the same situation, but the syntax they use is slightly different. In this case, we are specifically marking the function as far as Rust is concerned as async, and that affects what we're returning. So in this case, we're returning a result and that result can have a string. So we're not actually returning a future anymore. Now, once we get past the difference between synchronous and asynchronous, again, remember, the web view is always asynchronous. Your Rust code is either going to be sync, async, or it will return a future. When you're writing your command, you can set it up to where your data types are small primitives, such as a string. You can also set up your commands to accept a struct. That means that when you're providing the payload from the web view, you will do a more complex data type. So the payload for this one will end up being an object with a name and an age. That helps when your command payloads need to have more data and that structured data becomes valuable. I have a repo called Tori Playground. Anytime we are going through an example on the live stream and we don't have a great place to put it, it ends up just getting dumped into this repo. So it's not a mono repo per se, but it has a whole bunch of apps that we have over time created. You can see the you can see the timestamps. There's it goes back some time. So you can see in this example, we set up Tori Specta. And we did this to both experiment with that setup and see how the bindings were generated and how that felt, which again, lovely experience. 
you add the configuration macro to each of the commands that you're setting up, and then you kind of just use it on the front end with the type safety, which is great to have. And that is especially useful once you start to get into the more advanced. Like in this situation, we have a command. It is marked as async, and we put the specta macro on it. You can see here we're doing an on event. This is using a channel. Now, there are going to be situations where you need more and more advanced communication between the web view and Rust. At some point, you start to get into the cases where a message from the front end or a message from Rust doesn't necessarily end up being one to one. So if I invoke from the web view, Rust may need to do some work and we may want to respond multiple times. But this is sort of the next step in having more control over that communication between your web view and your Rust code. In this case, what we're doing is we're using the channels. There is also a little bit of documentation. If you look at calling Rust from the front end, there's a section on channels. Now, a channel is a way to handle streaming data. One thing to keep in mind, especially when you're getting into the more advanced side of commands, Anytime you're doing communication between the web view and Rust and back and forth, there's serialization. We can look at many of these examples. They use the derive Serde. And Serde is a very common library in the Rust ecosystem that handles serialization. When you're communicating, if you're communicating a lot with small messages, there's a, there's a few different data types and edge cases where that type of data ends up taking a lot of time to do the serialization. Using some of these more advanced APIs can potentially help depending on what you're trying to accomplish. The idea here is the invoke from the web view triggers execution in Rust. Now Rust is going to do some work. In this case, we are doing a download. It's an easy example to add a little bit of asynchronicity to the demo. And what it's doing is it's chunking up that download and then delivering it in pieces. So we can see on every chunk, we end up sending an event. So the front end, after firing off an invoke, is going to get multiple messages. There is an API in the front end to handle this situation. Now, the channel in the core API will handle the simple use cases. It will allow you to basically subscribe to and then like do a little bit of work every time you get a message. If you need to do something more advanced, you might end up having to write your own code on the front end to handle this. As those use cases become more concrete, I suspect that the APIs around these more advanced situations will evolve as well. So what this is gonna do in this specific example, every time we get a chunk, it is going to log on a message that a chunk has arrived. Now, this is useful for when the front end is firing off an invoke and is expecting data in sort of a generic form. There's potentially a use case where you might want to use another API. There is an example called the streaming example. This is likely only going to be useful for you if your front end code is already expecting the response in a specific shape. In this case, we are streaming a video element and that video element can handle this like buffered, buffered data. So we can save a little bit of work potentially by delivering the data in something that it can consume more directly rather than having to go through the serialization that has to happen when it's more generic. We can see in the front end code, we are creating a video element. We are using and setting the source to the convert file source. This is effectively giving us like a URL. So as far as our web view code is concerned, we are fetching data from a URL. That video component in your browser, in your web view, is reaching out and expecting it in a certain structure. Now in Rust, we use the API called register asynchronous UI scheme protocol. We can effectively create our own custom protocol schemes. So if web view code makes a request at this custom protocol, it can be handled by this instead of the default handling. Now, what's neat about that situation is, in this case, if we use the protocol stream, we get this custom handler that is returning a response. And that response comes from HTTP response. And that HTTP response ends up returning multi-part data. We're buffering the data and returning it in a big stream of chunks that the browser already knows how to process. As it's getting these chunks, it understands that it can parse these chunks based off of the multi-part specification. So this is effectively relying on web tech specifications. We can get quite custom in our communication between these pieces using some of these APIs. Again, don't be intimidated. It's very likely that you'll end up using 
commands, maybe async commands, and that might be as far as you need to go. If you check out and look at any of the plugins as examples, you'll see that many of them are just relying on a command and then using operating system functions or using crates within the Rust ecosystem. Using something like the register asynchronous URI scheme protocol, that's a mouthful. <laughs> it's going to be for very specific situations. But I want you to be aware that there's different steps or levels where you can you can continue to move up the chain of more advanced use cases if it's needed. Start out writing your commands as sync commands. Again, invoke will always be async, but in Rust you can write them as synchronous commands. Only start to level up your command as is required. You very likely will never need to use the register asynchronous URI scheme protocol, but now you know that it's here. So you can go sync go up to ace you can go up to async if you need it you can start to get more advanced with structs pull in pull in tori specta to handle that generation of the functions and types for your web view code then potentially start looking at channels if you need or if your expectation is that your front end or your back end are not responding in a one-to-one -one sort of fashion and then when you get into the real advanced use cases where you need to be very specific or your or web view is expecting data in a very specific way, then start to look at some APIs like this one. Now again, reminder, if this felt like a lot, you can potentially write your app using no Rust. Depending on your use case, you could get away with just using plugins. If your code is expecting to run in a web browser, it's likely that many of the APIs you're using and the type of application you're writing may not actually need to use too much of the operating system level functionality. The functions that you may need to use that are kind of a generic requirement, such as like file system handling, there's a plugin for that. All of the plugins in the official plugins workspace have JavaScript implementations. So you can get a lot done using just JavaScript. But if you do need to get into writing your own custom Rust, you're likely going to be wiring it up with commands, or at least that should be the default place to begin that process. I always start with the thing that you need. Make a command, make it sync, ship the thing and go from there. Now that you know all the different pieces that can potentially go into the code or plugin that you might need to write, I'd love to hear what you make with it. If you want to see experimentation playing around with some of these more eclectic APIs or more advanced functionality, we do a lot of experimenting on the stream, so hit that follow button. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. Bye.